Hello, good morning, good morning, good morning. And as you can see, can you see some daffodils? Can you see some daffodils there over on the left? It's an absolutely gorgeous morning. A spring morning. I'm going to go the scenic way because I'm very early. Look at that lovely view of those stakes there. The ground's all burned off with glyphosate and uh, ready for the trees to grow. Trees all gone in new this year. They had it, uh, they put a different crop in last year. I don't even know what it was, something they had to combine harvest. But uh, presumed to give the ground a change, you know, let all the apple parasites die off. There's cabbage fields on the left. All the cabbages have been picked now. Nothing but the, oh, no, 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 they're Brussels sprouts, aren't they? They're Brussels sprouts. Ha, 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 ha. What have we got here? Yeah. They're sprouting Brussels sprouts. And some cabbages. No, they must be Brussels sprouts because it's all ploughed up. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm not a natural farmer. I can grow a, I don't know what I could grow. I can grow trees. I can grow trees. I had a lot of fun at the weekend. Friday and Saturday of the Easter weekend, it was reasonably good weather. So I found the best thing to do is to get the right, get the appropriate tools for the job. So uh, to be quite honest with you, there's no point if you've got anything more than like an acre trying to uh, make do with uh, electrical cables and battery powered strimmers and stuff like that. You've got to get like the hefty gear. So you need a hefty uh, strimmer, something that's going to be painful to, to buy, something that's going to cost you six, seven hundred quid. Because that's the only thing that's going to uh, cope with uh, the amount of strimming that you need to do. And then got to get a petrol powered chainsaw and again not a, not a tiny one you don't need a massive one but you don't need a tiny one either but something reputable steel or a Husqvarna or something something that again is going to bring tears to your eyes when you when you buy it then uh, another tip with chainsaws is that you'll you'll start off sharpening the blades and I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a little go sharpening the blades. That's quite, you know, not a bad idea. But really, when the blade costs 12 quid or something, and, you know, you have to use a chainsaw to really see the difference between a blade, a dull blade and a, and a sharp blade. And a sharp blade is a joy to behold. So, you'll get, to get the whole job done in, a, in, a, in a half an hour or an hour with a sharp blade. Whereas with a dull blade, you'll still be hacking away after two, three hours. So learn how to change the uh, like the uh, chain on a chainsaw and put, put a new blade on at least once a year. I would say probably a couple of times a year. What else can I give you? Tips on chainsawing. Just in case you, uh, you know, you've got a spouse that you need to get rid of. Um, the one thing that knackers chains is, uh, well, uh, cutting stumps very, very close to the ground so you get stones and earth in the blade. And that will dull, dull the whole thing. So that's best done. If you've got a chain which is sort of just perfectly past its best, then that's the time to cut off all your stumps level with the ground because uh, that, that will do the blade in. And uh, the other thing is uh, fences, chain, chain link fences. Um, you know, you think, oh, I, I can cut quite close to that, and then you'll always catch it, always, always. always. So well, that doesn't necessarily do the whole chain in, but it will it'll possibly knacker a link or two. And the worst thing is it just buggers up the fence, you know, it just will pull the fence to bits. So then you're down there on your knees with a hefty pair of pliers trying to 
remake the fence. Why am I indicating? I go around that corner every morning. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a junction. Probably worth once. So I'm just uh, at the end of reading a really, really good book called The Book of Trespass. And it's by a guy who's, uh, you know, long had a bee in his bonnet about, uh, about uh, the, the Enclosure Act. <laughs> the fact that all the land, all the common land was enclosed. And... Uh, it's, it's a fantastic book and like most books it, it draws very heavily on historical uh, facts to explain why the world is how it is today and uh, I love that I think that's great I hope that's an increasing trend because um, <coughs> there's um, another book I read recently by a guy called Terry Bushell former editor of the uh, what was the Communist Party newspaper in the UK I know uh, Pravda anyway he's uh, married to a very charming Russian lady uh, translator um, lived in the UK for a long time H him certainly and her uh, also almost certainly and um, he wrote a book called Jihad, which is a short history of uh, the um, Islam, really, from 700 to 1700. And it covers the uh, expansion of Islam to the West. And also, you know, the expansion of Christianity through the Crusades to the East. And he's peppered the book, which is, uh, again, I think is appears to be historically quite rigorous um, with anecdotes and reimaginings of uh, executions and crusades and uh, sacking of towns and, villa and castles and things like that in a way that really it's a sort of a dual narrative style that I like and I've seen it twice in books now where you've got you're switching all the time and in some films you know you know where they say oh, well we're going to have a flashback well it's a book that style of writing that has these two books in one because one is what well, probably would be pretty dry uh, historical uh, narrative um, and on the one hand but on and then you sw switch over immediately to the like the first person point of view of somebody who's uh, a, a real life historical character who's, and some of these lives are just you know your jaw drops when you just <laughs> when you sort of read about how uh, things, you know, things used to happen. Anyway, uh, the so that's called Jihad, that's by uh, uh, Terry. And um, who I know actually, I must admit I know him, so full disclosure. And the other, uh, this other one, uh, Book of Trespass, is, is written again in the dual narrative style where you've got uh, consideration of the historical precedents and laws regarding uh, private land and at the same time um, he interweaves it with almost like a journal of his adventures uh, camping and walking and kayaking uh, all over the country and uh, again it's quite entertaining you know it's uh, It fits in nicely with those YouTube channels where this guy takes a drone and uh, sends drones up over factories and police stations and stuff like that. And you know, people come out and say to him, "No, you can't do that." Because we've got this, as I say, we've got this attitude in this country that everything is banned unless it's specifically allowed. Whereas other countries that inherited our law, such as Australia and um, America have um, the attitude that everything is allowed unless it's specifically banned and so uh, for example there's no common law right to navigate a river even if it's a navigable river 
there's no common law right to navigate it. Um, whereas in uh, Australia and America, the law states quite specifically that the, the rivers are like a highway, they're like a freeway, and that uh, anyone who wants to use a river to get from A to B is, is perfectly entitled to. So, um, my only criticism of that book, the, the Book of Trespass, is that uh, well, he's, in a certain constituency, he undermines his, his arguments a bit by, you know, stating that he almost always goes to, you know, he enjoys the outside for its opportunity to lie under a tree and, and smoke a joint or take some magic mushrooms or something. So, you know, which probably sort of his, his credentials in the society that he moves, but it has to his credentials, but it does subtract from his credentials a bit. I'm sure of you. Never sure of something to say, but I'm, I'm sure of you. So if only this car was powered by hot air, it, it, it never ran out of fuel. And the other thing is, although towards the end he does try and make an appointment with his local landowning MP, to have a chat about um, property rights, the MP appears sort of chooses chooses not to engage with him, um, and says that and basically sums it up by saying that the the ownership of the property basically uh, bestows ownership of the argument. Uh, so you can't really you know you can't get into an argument with someone who's a landowner because they're uh, not motivated very to look very hard at why they um, how they came to be own the land. I don't know, it's a bit busy this. I'm quite I'm quite early this morning. Oh really? Why don't you indicate left and then keep coming round? Oh, I tell you, that's that bloody new highway code rule, isn't it? Is that, that new, you know the rule I'm talking about? The one where people indicate right when they're going left, round and round about and stuff like that. I'm gonna look that up today and find out what that's all about because that is really annoying. That bloke was indicating left. It looked like he was gonna go off left up the road that I'm coming out of. So I start pulling out and he just keeps coming round. Which he may have just forgotten that he had his indicator on. But why, if you're going to go out to a roundabout and you're going off at one o'clock or two o'clock, would you indicate left? There's, that, there's some stupid highway code rule that I'm never going to find out whose idea it was. Because there's no responsibility, there's no accountability in this country. You can't, someone's really dumb at a high level and you can't, uh, you can't ever find out who it is that's, that's uh, organised things in a way which is so patently dumb and stupid. Uh, they're, never, they're never held to account. It's impossible to bring them to account. So yeah, so I do a bit of reading. What I do is I tend to get up early in the morning. So I get up about, say, six. Do you know, Sunday Times, if you ever read Sunday Times, they have a column there about people and um, their day, their working day. So these, these are the masters of the universe, the very high powered bosses, chief executives, etc. Oh, I might pull in and get some fuel. Nah, I'll do it later. And uh, they always say the one common thread that runs through it all is they get up at really stupid o'clock in the morning. And by stupid o'clock, I mean five-ish. So, I got the idea that, you know, because of this association, and you know what they say about correlation does not equate to causation. It doesn't, it's not why they're rich. It may be why they're rich. It might be the cause. But certainly, it's, it, there's a correlation between high-powered, movers and shakers and an early rising. I've never heard anyone say, uh, so he's a chief executive, he's worth 200 million quid, 
and he never goes to bed before, you know, he's been down the nightclub at three o'clock earliest. And then he sleeps in until half 11. They never, unless I suppose they're a nightclub tycoon, uh, tycoon they might do that. But. They always say they wake up at five. And then I, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna get out. Cause, and also they also do like one hour in the gym or something in the morning, which seems to be the favorite time to do the gym if you're a mover and a shaker and you've got a gym in your own house, obviously. So, um, so I'm getting up early thinking this is gonna make me rich and famous. Whereas in fact, what I realized actually <laughs> is that I do that anyway. And here's some comforting news to those of you who, you know, a bit, you know, don't really want to get up at five o'clock in the morning. The chances are that you probably do wake up early and just lie there in bed checking the news or Facebook or whatever, you know, TikTok, whatever you are, you check. And I've got a sneaky suspicion that that's what they, when they say, oh, I get up at 5.30 and, and uh, deal with papers or uh, emails and that, that's what all they're doing. They're just lying in bed. They probably get up about seven or something, you know. Unless you get the occasional one who's got a driver waiting outside at half past five because he likes to be in his office in London at seven. And then you get the other occasional one where they've got a lot of interest in uh, uh, Asia and America. So what they do is they are up early for Asia and then they have to stay up late for, uh, uh, or, or they get up early because they're trying to get the last few hours of America. So, but that's like a particular case, isn't it? So I'm thinking, actually, I'm not, I'm high powered anyway. I'm quite free. I'll wake up at four o'clock and check the news. What's that doing there? So in conclusion, or as I used to say at the GDC, I am coming to a conclusion. Just not yet. In conclusion. That's why that's there, because of the sun. I told you all about chainsaws. Don't bother sharpening them. Honestly, you can do the job. In the time it takes you to sharpen one chainsaw, you can do the job. And not only is sharpening them not a brilliant idea, the, the links tend to loosen up a bit as well. So, you know, I mean, you can tighten them up a couple of times, but really, when those links, they've got a limit on I've never had one break on me, but you know, there, there are other working parts of the chainsaw is the link, isn't it? So, uh, strimmers, get a powerful strimmer, get a decent cord, chunky cord, get the thickest one that will fit on your strimmer because then you won't need to, you know, be constantly lengthening it and exchanging it because you've run out. And you can cut through really some really serious stuff with a strimmer. Um, like these bloody uh, cow parsley that's springing up all over the place. If you strim it at this point with a strimmer, you can easily strim it. If you wait until it gets a woody stem that's about an inch in diameter, then it's very difficult to strim. What else can I tell you? Strimming is the most dangerous thing. If Honestly, people say, oh, well, chainsawing is dangerous. And, Edge trimming is dangerous, might cut your finger off or cut the cable. But of all the things you do, strimming is the thing where you're going to lose an eyeball. Honestly, if you are going to go strimming, I would certainly wear uh, a Forester's hat, you know, crash helmet, full visor, goggles if you've got a decent quality pair of goggles, thick overalls. Wellington boots and welder's gloves, which you can get on Amazon for about, if you buy thick gardener's gloves, you'll pay 20 quid. But if you Google welder's gloves, you'll get these big thick leather red welder's mitts, not mitts, they're, they're actual gloves. And they're absolutely superb for pulling out hawthorn and all sorts of stuff. 
and uh, and that and then and only then will I go streaming because I tell you it's the most lethal in terms of getting things hitting your head hitting your body you come in absolutely covered in crap and you always have to wash all your clothes when you've been streaming then uh, spraying I've got a knapsack sprayer uh, Pegler C P3 I think it's called 20 litres capacity um, and at 180 quid your eyes going to water when you buy it uh, you'll only ever use one nozzle comes with a load of nozzles you only ever use one and you can use that to spray your glyphosate on drives and uh, what I would do is I would I would stick to filling it with glyphosate because you can't really change it and put like lawn weed killer in it one week and and everything killer in it the next week your your, your lawn's not going to thrive um, which you uh, mix up 7.2 grams per litre I think you'll have to check that it's about you can buy this um, you can buy this uh, glyphosate in 5 litre containers oh my god don't tell me what's fences going up there and it's uh, 400 mil I think in 20 litres so it could work there Uh, 7.2 I think is the right dose for the farmers. You, you'll get it in, you can buy it in 3.6 grams in B&Q a litre, but that's not really, you know, that's for that little weeds. Um, and again, I know people have a fit about glyphosate, but I mean, I don't have a problem with it. I've looked at it dispassionately and I'm, I'm fairly happy. It's okay for the, to be used in nature. And, um, Farmers use it a lot to burn off the uh, grass underneath their trees because then the trees get more rain. So uh, chainsaw, strimmer, what else you need? You've got your, well I mean the tractor with a six foot rotating cutter on the back is useful for cutting the grass. And, um, and that's about it really. But I think with gardening, when you've got a decent bit of land, you've got to go big or go home. I could probably, you know, you don't need a tractor with a six foot blade on the back to cut what I've got. I could probably do it with a Toro or some sort of ride on, not a little ride on mower with a tiny little thing underneath, but, but a ride on mower with two big plates on the front, similar to a groundsman's mower. And, uh, Hello, who's he smoking away? With a funny leg. Don't get run over. Yeah, so not much to do with dentistry, but a lot of advice if you're um, looking after a decent bit of land. The biggest problem is you've got you you will have all this stuff, but it won't be any good. You'll have a little you'll have a small chainsaw that you bought from B and Q or something. You'll have a well, you know some Chinese chainsaw. You'll have a little strimmer that you're used to doing around the edges. Then you move into a big property and you find that they're they're all just useless, you know. But um, the way to do it, okay, this last thing. The way to do it is you cut all the grass, right? Then you go around with the strimmer and you strim the bits that you couldn't get to with the mower. And then lastly you go around and you spray the few very few bits that you can't get to with a strimmer or that you need to you need to spray along the edge of walls and stuff like that because you don't want to be strimming walls all the time all right i'm hope that's been useless i was always has been helpful i hope it's been helpful i don't think it's been helpful at all so anyway what the hell it's something different isn't it hmm? well, why not okay i'll talk to you soon bye